Hello, 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 divine ones. Welcome to the well-being sessions. I am Jerome Braggs, or affectionately known as the well-being Sherpa. And it is my divine honor to be sharing space with Dr. Robert Holden, who is a best-selling author of many books like Happiness Now, Lovability, by the way. If you all know me personally, you know I'm constantly talking about this book. My book is like just it's got butterflies like in it marking where like all the special places and all that you know I talk about this all the time um, if you're a personal if you have a personal relationship with me you know if I've probably already given you that book as a gift um, but this is the author of the book and probably one of the one of my favorite teachers on the topics of happiness success and love and as one of the cornerstones of well-being is self-love, it is my divine honor to welcome Dr. Robert Holden to this session to talk about self-love. So hello, Robert. Thank you for sharing space with me today. Jerome, thank you very, very much. Thank you for that wonderful compliment of showing me a copy of my book with all of those underlined bits in there. That's so cool. That's it's what a writer dreams of, you know, especially in those moments when the words aren't coming and you're wondering why the hell you're writing this book even. Yeah, you just so, that yeah. book not just that book, but the happiness project which I also underwent, um, and your your viewpoints on success and the books you've written about success just for everyone and all of the people that are part of my tribe who do not know mm -hmm. you yet, it is just a blessing to be able to share you and the wisdom that I know that you have and the life experience and, and that you speak from with those individuals out there, especially about this topic. Because you, when I read Lovability and I've, I've watched your videos and I've followed you on Facebook and social media, um, your perspective and your teachings on love and the importance of self-love are the closest um, of probably anybody that I've that I've connected with or that I've read to what I learned in my own journey and what what I am here today like I'm literally living today because of the journey I took with loving myself yeah and so the stuff you teach was just like ah oh, it was like right here on the on the like tips of my lips it was just really mm -hmm. juicy and delicious so I just want to dive into that, like... Great, let's do it. So my first question for you is, what is your definition of self-love? Okay, thanks for a nice easy one to start with, <laughs> Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here it is, okay? My definition of self-love is... It's the awareness that your essence is love. And uh, so in other words, it's like a, a self-knowledge, a self-knowing that love isn't just an emotion, even though we, we feel it and can feel it very strongly. Love's not just an idea, uh, even though we can think about it, talk about it, write about it. Um, love isn't just an energy, even though we experience it in the cells of our body. It's much, much more than that. I think really love points to the essence of who we are. It's our spiritual DNA. It's why we crave love so much. It's why we feel so good when we are being the loving person that we want to be, because it's like the most authentic act we could we could be doing to, to, to love and to be loved. Um, and for all of those reasons, I think self-love is the awareness that we're made of love. Mm. You know, you said something uh, in the book, which um, the truth of who we are is that we are lovable. Like that's the that's the core truth. And I know just in my own experience, but in my experience with working with people as well, that really owning that truth can be embracing that truth in the beginning is can be really hard to, to, that can be real it can be the, probably one of the most challenging things I think that we face in our lives is really coming from the space that I am lovable which is our core truth mm -hmm. um, so my question because this is the question that I get all the time is okay so I get it I'm supposed to love myself right is what people mm -hmm. say yeah. so like what is 
I'm just starting this journey. I'm just new to the even the conversation really of what loving myself is. This, but beyond like buying the shirt I really want at the mall or getting a massage, right? Yeah. So what is that thing for you that begins the journey of that? Begins the conversation of it? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to share with you a good place to begin. Um, that said, what I'm going to share with you took me a long time to work out, and it wasn't something that I did at the beginning of my own self-love journey. But I would say that a good place to begin when it comes to self-love is to understand that your soul, the essence of who you are, loves you very much. And actually your essence, your higher mind, your soul, whatever you want to call it, but that self loves you very much and is trying to love you the whole time if you would listen to it. So in other words, I think there is a voice of love um, within us that we have to learn to pay attention to. This voice for love is natural. It's uh, in some ways easy and obvious, except that we have, for one reason or another, um, lost our attunement to that voice for love, and um, for good reason. You know, we've all of us experienced difficulties, um, and worse than that, wounds and traumas, where the voice for love all but seems to fade away and um, have no, no volume to it or even any existence to it, Jerome. So that voice for love gets tuned out um, by other voices, the voice of fear, the voice of self-doubt, the voice of self-judgment, the voice of self-criticism, the voice of defensiveness, the voice of skepticism, the voice of pessimism, the voice of cynicism. I mean, you know, it's like these voices, like a crowd of voices show up in our life. And all of these voices in one way or another are trying to defend our self-image and I say that specifically I mean I could have just said defend us but really it is defending a self-image about us so all of those voices they're not wrong um, in many ways they are an effort to love us but actually it's only the voice for love that can really love us and our job is to be able to tune into that voice and we all of us I think have our moments where we let that voice speak and uh, when it does, hopefully we pay attention and our life is a lot better for it. But I would say a great act of self-love, if we were talking practically, Jerome, I would say one of the greatest acts of self-love is to have a daily spiritual practice. And a daily spiritual practice is your non-negotiable five minutes where before you get busy, before you walk out the front door, before you do your commute, before you encounter the world, you first listen to that voice for love. And maybe you ask that voice for love a question like, how could I love myself today? And you listen. The chances are, if this is the first time you're trying the exercise, you'll probably think you didn't hear anything. So you've got to stick with it for a little bit. But it doesn't take long. And the rewards are so great, I would say, be patient. But over time, you'll start to recognize that voice. I say it's a voice. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily hear it in an auditory way in your mind. You may get a picture. You may get an image. A thought might come to you. Uh, nonetheless, you're beginning to tune in now to your true voice. And that voice for love can guide you. It's intelligent. But what you need to do is make the space to be able to listen. And I think, so that's a good start. So step one, it's the awareness that your soul is already trying to love you. And all you need to do is not make an extra special effort now to try and love yourself. More, it's about stopping being receptive and allowing that voice for love to speak to you. Yeah, so I, it's, you're speaking to so many places um, in my own journey here. And, and I'm remembering that part of me that when I had my near-death experience and the answer of what, what the question was for me during that experience was, 
I wanted to know how to live well and be well. And the answer that came back to, for me in that ex during that experience was like the, the whole path is to learn how to love yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And what my decision was, was that I was going to listen for the voice of love and I was going to let that voice lead me. But the challenge was, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's the thing that I want to ask you, is how, what does the voice of love sound like? Mm -hmm. Because that's because you spoke to you and, and you speak to that so much. And I know that this is a question that, that just is juicy for you. But what yes. does that voice sound like and what doesn't it sound like? Mm -hmm. OK, nicely said. So. <clears throat> I mean, for me personally, that voice is um, most of the time. The encouragement is how to be rather than what to do. The encouragement is how to show up in the world rather than big plans, fancy cars, cool careers. It's more essential than that. It's reminding me who I really am and it's encouraging me to be present, to be grateful, to be open, to be receptive, that type of a thing. So I feel like often that voice is talking to me directly to my being rather than the doing, the getting, the going, the wanting, the having and everything else. That for me is an education in itself because what I think the voice is teaching me is, is that it's like the voice is saying, I only need to talk to you and how to be because you're already enough. So that's really cool. After that, I think the voice is kind, it's compassionate, it's peaceful, it's measured. I feel it in my heart and actually sometimes when I put my hand on my heart it seems to activate the listening. The voice never takes sides. I've never heard the voice for love judge another person. Um, I've never heard the voice for love um, tell me what another person should be doing with their life. It's like the voice for love is only telling me about me and my life. That voice has never criticized me. It's never judged me. It speaks in the present tense. Doesn't take me to the future very often. It's all present tense stuff. Most of all, I think I feel peaceful afterwards. And I'm always left with the feeling that where I am is the right place to be, who I am is enough, that, that there's no shortage here. Like, it's not like I have to put an extra eff effort in before I'm going to get the payout. The payout is immediate. So there's a few examples, Jerome, of how, how it is for me. What I would say is I think a lot of people think about the voice for love rather than listening to the voice for love. <laughs> and if you're thinking about the voice for love, it's not really going to work. You know, you've got to go for it. You've really got to let that voice for love just, if you pay attention to it, I think what will ultimately happen is one day you'll, you'll smile to yourself and say, gosh, I used to, this voice is so clear to me. It's so real. It's funny that I used to think maybe it wasn't real mm -hmm. and that it didn't exist. Uh, and that, I don't think that takes too long to happen. I don't think it does really. So it's, yeah, it's a cool thing. It's a cool thing. I would say the voice for love, one of the greatest things it taught me, what self-love has taught me is, is that there's a world of difference between self-improvement and self-acceptance. And that has been breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough territory for me because I was so into self-improvement. I mean, I was, I believed in self-love, but not yet. I was going to love myself eventually. <laughs> all, I, all I had to do was be successful, happy, in love, abundant, and then I was going to love myself. 
<laughs> yeah, for me, I'd add like six pack. For me, it was like six, adding six pack and then really big bank account of balance to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it was so, you know, self love was something that was going to happen eventually. And all I had to do was improve myself, keep working, keep doing it, and it would happen. But I, I had a revelation. And I do think of it as a revelation uh, where one day it really occurred to me that the problem with self-improvement was that I was trying to improve upon a self that I really didn't know very well. I was trying to improve myself before I even had a chance to be myself. And it occurred to me one day that actually I should try self-acceptance. And, and look, if it... My, my feeling was, well, if it doesn't work, I've probably just wasted a morning, so never mind. But I sat down and I just took some time just to imagine what is it like to be me when I accept myself. And Jerome, it was like time travel. It was like everything that I hoped to experience in 10 years' time I was experiencing now. It was like, oh, my God, I, I have like moved into self-acceptance in a big way like and even if I'm only imagining it this is beautiful but I stuck with this I kept doing this I'd sit down and I would just I would just literally sit and and I'd say to myself right let's imagine what it's like to be me now that I'm accepting myself and I felt peaceful I felt calm I felt inspired I felt like I had energy and I felt like ideas were coming to me of what to do and how to be. And, and it was like, wow, this is fantastic. And the amazing thing that happened over time was I saw that my life started to improve. And it was like, whoa, this is like amazing. I mean, this is really, really different. Um, I also noticed that the more I accepted myself, the more loved I felt by everybody else. That was like, whoa, that's like huge, you know, and and it was, you know, I, I now I just say to everybody, you know, self-acceptance is so good. Everybody should try it at least once in their life, you know, like yeah. give it a try. Give it a try now. Uh, the fear of self-acceptance is that if I accept myself, then I won't progress. I won't grow. I won't. Nothing will happen. But that's for most people, I would call that a theoretical fear. Um, it's not that people have tried self-acceptance and found they didn't grow and nothing happened and their life came to a stop and they had to retire prematurely and because nothing was, you know, there was no mojo, no flow, nothing. So, you know, these are what I call theoretical fears. Try it. Sit down, do what I did. Just imagine what it's like to love yourself. Imagine what it's like to accept yourself and I think it's, it's a, for me it was a miracle it's so I love it was perfect segue just what you just said to this next statement because I have been saying for the last few years I had that very same experience with acceptance and I've been saying that there are only in my journey in my understanding there are two things that lead to miracles every time Every time I've experienced them, every time I've practiced them, there are only these two elements that lead to a miracle every time. The first one is surrender. The second mm -hmm. one is self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. I have never not experienced a miracle in my life when I wow. haven't just <clears throat> stood back and allowed myself to love myself and make peace with myself just as I am with just what I don't have or have. Um, and just where I am or not am, right? Yeah, and I beautiful. just ex just shower and saturate myself with acceptance and love. It has led to a miraculous transformation in every area of my life. Every time, every time. Beautiful. The key is to remember that, right? <laughs> but well said, yeah. Well said. But that yeah. that's that, and so that leads me to this kind of this next question because you kind of spoke to this but there are two parts um kind of in in, in my journey and my teaching of, of what i learned was there's like four kind of elements to cornerstones really to loving ourselves 
And one of them, you gave me the wording for that, actually, which was unconditional positive regard for ourselves. Right. And um, another one that I think we don't talk about, so I would like you to speak to that, because you've kind of spoken to that, but exactly like the concept of unconditional positive regard for ourselves. Mm. And then the next portion of that, which I don't think we talk, I, we talk about enough, is trusting ourselves and surrendering. Mm. which I know surrender is a, is, a, is a really juicy topic for you as well. So I'd like, to, I'd like for you to kind of speak to those two things of like what, what, it, what, it, what it looks like, feels like in the journey of like unconditionally, no mm. matter what, positive yeah. regard for ourselves. Beautiful. Well, <clears throat> unconditional positive regard is a, a statement which belongs to Carl Rogers, I wrote about it in Lovability, and fundamentally, it's a code for self-love, and if we were to experience it, and let's do this, let's do this right now, let's for one minute, I'm going to time it, but for one minute, let's both of us allow ourselves just to imagine what it's like to be us when we're not judging ourselves. Okay, so the minute begins now. We'll just take a nice deep breath. And I'd like you to imagine, and I'm doing it too, this is what it's like to be me when I'm not judging myself. Now you take a nice deep breath. No judgments, no self-judgments. No psychology. Now, it may be a little disorientating to begin with, but that's all right. You can just let it be quiet inside. And you don't have to get this right, by the way. You just have to imagine it. This is me when I'm not judging myself. Because the sky is not judging us. And the sun and the moon, they're not judging us. And the mountains and the oceans and the birds in the trees. You know, they're not judging us. And if you're experience of the divine has anything to do with love and you know that the divine is love then you surely in this moment must know for a fact that the divine has never judged you either because love doesn't judge so right now coming up to the end of our minute this is a chance for us to see who we really are And we can only do that if we're willing to suspend the judgments, even just for a little bit. So that's a, a well-being meditation <clears throat> of the highest order. And, you know, I think what I learned from A Course in Miracles, which I'm a student of, is that in any given moment we're choosing between vision and judgment. Uh, when we judge, um, we are playing a game where all we're all we're going to see is our judgments. You know, if we have a judgment about ourselves, we look in the mirror. We don't see who we are. We see our judgment about ourselves. If we have a judgment about somebody we love, a family member, a friend, we're not seeing who they are. We're just seeing our theory of who we think they are. So that's the game of judgment. The game of vision is, oh, I wonder what it would be like if I just stopped judging. I wonder what I would see if I wasn't judging. And that, I think, has something to do with vision. That has something to do with unconditional positive regard. So that's where I would 
start with that one, Jerome. Um, and now I've completely forgotten part two of your, <laughs> of, your, of your question. What was it? I think actually in the in the very what you I think you've answered it in many ways, which was trusting yourself and surrender. But what I've been and mm -hmm. even in that meditation, what came up for me is that it, just going back to one of the first things that you said that my soul and the divine and life itself is always loving me and always trying to love me. Yeah. And <clears throat> if I can trust in that, just trust mm -hmm. in that, right? That yeah. life loves me, my, my, I am lovable and that is my truth. And yeah. That um, the very essence and the very experience and the very creation of all that is loves me. So yeah. what is there really to like mm -hmm. concern or improve or fight against or push against? I think that's beautiful, and and to that point, as a practical exercise, I mean, I would draw from the work I did with Louise Hay and the work on Life Loves You. Life Loves You is an affirmation, Louise Hay's favorite affirmation, um, and really Life Loves You, the book, is an inquiry into basic trust, and basic trust is this idea that Firstly, I am lovable. The essence of who I am is lovable. And also that I am loved. You know, basic trust is the awareness that love is always loving us and that love leaves nobody out. And so, again, being practical about this, you know, a great exercise is just to just to make a list of the ways that life is loving you right now and just pay attention to that and if you're like most people and you've never done a list like this um you may think well i can't think of anything off the top of my head so i won't do the exercise and that would be a common response to an exercise like this give it time pay attention notice ways life is loving you right now and I, I promise you, you, give this five minutes, you're going to feel better than you did five minutes ago. And you're also going to be opening yourself up to love coming to you from all different directions. And that's a surrender. That's a basic trust right there. You can take that sort of an exercise further and just um, make a decision every day to let life love you a little bit more. And that's a surrender too. Um, it's a surrender to your theories of love, to how you think love should happen, the ways love should come to you. You know, love's going to come at you from every angle if you let it. And one of the teachings of love is to let yourself be loved in, in, in ways that amaze you, yeah. that take you beyond your self-image, if you like. So... You know, just taking some time to consider the possibility that life loves you is a beautiful thing. It really is. It's hard to experience that when we're not loving ourselves. So uh, here we have a lovely virtuous circle. The more we're willing to love ourselves, the more we become aware that life loves us. The more we're willing to love ourselves, the less difficult we make it for others to love us. Let's be honest about it. When we're not loving ourselves, we make it difficult for people to love us. Mm -hmm. We question it, you know, and we, we question their love. And, you know, and when they're loving us, it's, we're not feeling it. However, we keep loving ourselves. It keeps us open. As we open ourselves up, we consider the possibility that life loves us. As life loves us, that reinforces the idea that I'm lovable. Now we're in a virtuous circle. That's a beautiful thing. And beautiful thing about it is that your self-love now has to benefit everybody else because there's no way you can keep that honey for yourself. That's, that's <laughs> something you've got to spread around. Yeah, um, that's so beautiful. I, 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 I truly believe I am much more... Um, I won't say necessarily valuable, but I am much more of a nourishing and expansive presence to those in my life because of the journey that I took to love myself. Mm -hmm. I love the way you put that, Jerome. Beautifully said. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, 
it's interesting, like one of the greatest accusations of self-love is that it's selfish. And again, I would just have to say anybody who really holds that as a belief, I would I would challenge you and I would say I think that's a theoretical belief. I don't think your in the field research is thorough enough. I would say um, people who genuinely love themselves are uh, they get over themselves so quickly. They know that their life isn't just about them. They understand something about the oneness. And you know when you're loving yourself, the world's a better place. Why? Because if you're not judging yourself, you have no desire to judge another person. No desire whatsoever. Why would you take yourself out of the experience of love just to judge someone else? You're not going to do it. Love is insightful, intelligent. You know, it, I think love is our true mind, by the way, Jerome. I think it really is. It's the essence of who we are, and I think it's our true mind. You stick with that. And, you know, your life lights up and the whole world benefits from it, too. And I do believe on a on a profound level that we are here to help this world evolve in the direction of love. You know, that's to me the whole game now. We've got to help the world evolve in the direction of love. That is humanity's shared purpose. I believe, you know, there's all manner of help available to us for that process. The more we're willing to love ourselves, the more it takes us into our purpose, our creativity, you know, and ultimately, I think, helps us to be the men and women that we most want to be so that we can really, as I say, help this big earth ship, you know, move in the direction of love. Ah, uh, okay. So we only have just a few more minutes. And I think that was, I almost want to end there, but I promised myself I would ask these questions. <laughs> uh, these are lightning round questions. So just whatever yeah. comes up for you. Go. Um, so, yeah. So what, so what is love teaching you or reminding you? Actually, I don't think love actually teaches. I think it reminds. What is mm -hmm. love most reminding of you, reminding you of right now in your life? All right. Okay. Lightning round. Being is the new doing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the well-being session. So what does well-being mean to you? Well, I think it is having more of a relationship to being. You know, it's like I've tried all the other stuff, the doing, the going, the getting, the wanting, the having, the helping, the supporting, the learning, the journeying to somewhere. Like the last thing I ever tried was being and I still I feel like it's the frontier that I still have to discover more of, you know, literally being the power of being the power. And, and I think that's it, to be really honest, you know, the power of like recognizing that my true value comes from being present, being where I am and not trying to prove myself and not try to be somebody, you know, like stop trying to be somebody and allow the, the being that you are to shine through. Like, that's pretty cool. I think that's where I'm at right now, Jerome. It's, it's, it's big for me, you know, it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so next question is how does, why is, well, actually how, why is self love important to that beingness for you? I think it's because in the past I, I, I've only really allowed myself moments of being once I've done enough. And so in a way the doing was a way of paying off <clears throat> the worthiness, you know, the worthiness just to be. Like, that's a massive thing. So I think that... Um, you know, I've been very driven by doing in my life and, uh, you know, and accomplishing. And, and that's, you know, not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's pretty cool in some ways. But I'm, I'm just learning more and more that when I'm willing to do nothing, the divine can step in and do something that can often be much greater than what it was I was just about to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have the last question is 
What do you most need, most want for your well-being at this moment in your life? And I think you've spoken a little bit to it, but I want to speak to that. What do you most want and most need for your well-being at this moment in your life? Hmm, such a nice question. Wow. Jerome, it's so wordless, you know, because I've so enjoyed the interview. Like, I felt like I'm I'm right here with you at the moment, you know. It's so nice. And yet I want to be able to share something. I think it's the recognition that... that we're really all of us okay, actually. Know that the supreme well-being is the awareness that our being is well. You know that it's we're not. I mean, you know that's a massive thing to say. Um, you know, on the level of ego and personality, there's so many dramas, and you know we know about 